I want to thank you all for coming this evening. And um, I want to thank our hosts, Columbia University um, School of Journalism, the June and Simon Lee Center for Global Reporting, which is directed by tonight's lead speaker. The center was formally launched last weekend at the International Press Institute's World Congress, and this is their inaugural event. So congratulations, Asma. Um, and thank you to the Overseas Press Club uh, for convening this conversation. For those of you who don't know it, the OPC is the largest um, and longest running, oldest institution or club for um, international journalists. Um, I am a proud member. Asmat is an officer because she does everything. Um, and uh, if you'd like to be a member, please come talk to either one of us afterwards. Also, our executive director, Patricia Kranz, is here. Patty, are you in the room? Are you still downstairs? She's still downstairs. Um, but you can talk to any of us about. Um, membership for students, it's only $20. And the OPC does give out press badges if you ask for one. One of the perks of be becoming a member of the OPC are conversations like this, right? It is a club full of people like Osmot doing work like Osmot. And we began convening this series of conversations earlier this year. We call them How I Did It. And basically, it's meant to give freelancers an opportunity to meet someone like them who has successfully produced important journalism, right? And the journalism that we're going to talk about tonight is an extraordinary feat of journalism. Um, I'm not the only one who thinks so. In awarding this work a Pulitzer Prize, the board at Columbia described it as courageous and relentless. For those of you who don't know it, and I actually don't think there's a journalist in the world who doesn't know it, but it bears uh, repeating. Um, we make them walk by it every day. Right? <laughs> Sorry about that. These stories, the stories we're gonna talk about today expose the devastating civilian toll of US-led airstrikes in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. A military offensive that President Obama hailed as the most precise air campaign in history was playing out as anything but precise for the people on the ground. What's more, the story showed how the military designed its system to keep the real toll a secret and to make it hard to hold anyone to account. To get inside of that story, to say that wasn't easy is an understatement. As you'll hear in this conversation, the reporting for this project took five years, an analysis of a massive trove of military documents, daring work in combat zones, and the persistence of a team of investigative journalists led by the, the dynamic duo that is sitting with us today. Asmat Khan, is an investigative reporter at the New York Times. She is a Carnegie Fellow, the Birch Assistant Professor of Journalism here at Columbia, and the director of the Lee Center for Global Journalism, as I mentioned earlier. In addition to the Pulitzer Prize, her reporting has won two National Magazine Awards, two Overseas Press Club Awards, a Polk Award, and the Hillman Prize. Her editor at the New York Times Magazine is Luke Mitchell. He is a story editor at the Times Magazine. He was previously a senior editor at Harper's um, and the deputy editor of Popular Science. The stories he edited at those publications have received many honors, including the John B. Oaks Award for Distinguished Environmental Journalism and the National Magazine Award for Reporting. He's also been a writer, and his work has appeared in the London Review of Books, the New York Times, the Washington Post, among other publications. So let's welcome our guests. I told both of them as we prepared for this that I love this format because I think that 
you know, one, it not only allows us to get behind the scenes of the work, it gets us behind the scenes of a relationship that I think is really important to producing the kind of work that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and Asma, uh, you know, being the wonderful educator that she is, has sort of prepared a slideshow that will at least get us get the conversation started um, about how she began this work and what some of the findings of this work were. So please, Asma. Thank you. I'm just going to step over here so that you can see this. Um, but it's such an honor to be here with both Ginger and Luke, Luke, who I've, with whom I've been working on this for so many years now and has played such an essential role. And he'll be able to peel back the layers of the behind the scenes, things that are sometimes still new to me, I'm hearing about later. Sure, yeah, I'm short. <laughs> um, so essentially, you know, definitely when the Q&A time comes, like he'll get very candid. So ask lots of great questions and pry as much as you can out of him. Because uh, I'm curious too. So um, I just want to take you back to sort of the origins of this project and something known as Operation Inherent Resolve. Um, one second. So this began in late 2014, and it was America's air war against ISIS. And it was really incredible. Videos were being uploaded in real time to counter ISIS's propaganda. This was a coalition led by the United States. And I remember very explicitly, you know, I've been watching this war, I've been covering this war, but I saw a front page article in the New York Times that said 25,000 ISIS fighters had been killed in the air war against ISIS, period. And I had been tracking, you know, how many civilians had been killed that the government had admitted at the time, and it was 21. And that's really impressive. That is stunning. And I kind of was looking more into how does this work? What does it look like? And, you know, you can see these incredibly precise videos of different targets that we were hitting, in this case, a car bombing factory, a BBIED factory. And you could see with such incredible detail what that factory looked like before, during, and after, and what we'd done to carry that out. This was the view we were getting from the air. And it's really stunning. Now, I just want to take a moment to step back and tell you a little bit about people in Mosul who were living under ISIS rule, like why we were doing this bombing, what we were trying to take back, what we were trying to achieve through this air campaign. And so Mosul, Iraq is, you know, one of the most densely populated cities in Iraq the crown jewel of ISIS's territory in Iraq. And, you know, this is where families are really struggling to survive. This is a man named Basim Razo, whom I've met, who lived with his families in, you know, a really beautiful area of Mosul known as the woods on the Tigris River. He'd formerly lived in the United States, and he lives there with his wife, Mayada, his brother, Mohaned, his daughter, Tuka, and his nephew, Najib. And they really found ISIS rule incredibly oppressive. They would try to hunker down in their own house to, you know, have barbecues and picnics. You know, the women in the family were being asked to fully veil and getting in trouble if they didn't wear the exact right kind of gloves. Um, and so they really just stayed together as a family in two units. Basim and his brother lived in two adjoining homes. And one day, Najib, the nephew, you know, set out to go get a dairy cream for morning breakfast. And when he goes to the market, ISIS arrests him. They accuse him of having a Western logo on his t-shirt and a Western haircut. So they shave his head in a manner that's really embarrassing in Iraqi culture. And they gave him 10 lashes and he became incredibly depressed. You can see it in the posts that he updated to Facebook that this was just a really tough, lonely time for him. Now, this is what it was like to live under ISIS, but another part of living under ISIS was the air campaign. And what I didn't tell you earlier when I showed you that video, this video that you watched, was that these were the homes of Basim Razo and his brother Mohanad. And on that night in September of 2015, they didn't hit a car bombing factory. They had a family, including Tuka, who you can see here. 
holding a firework the night before. She died. Mayata died. Mohana died. And Najib died. And, um, you know, I met Basim and I was incredibly moved. And I wanted to know how often this happened. So I sought to do a sample. I wanted to know how frequently what you just saw happen, these videos that are uploaded with total certainty. How often are these going wrong? And so I wanted to do a ground investigation. I started in a town called Kayara, and I basically just went door to door, distinguishing airstrikes from local detonations, from things that ISIS may have done, for example, bombing a wedding hall, from things that locals may have done after ISIS left, you know, in retribution, if an ISIS judge lived in a particular house. And in my very first trip to Kayara, of the first 10 strikes I went to, half resulted in civilian casualties. And that was stunning to me if you compare that to the numbers that I cited earlier, right? So, you know, I went door to door in these neighborhoods. I looked at where ISIS did actually operate from at what periods of time to try to understand why something might have been hit that resulted in a civilian casualty. Um, we recorded photographs from a drone that basically rendered 3D animations to try to understand, you know, what this looked like, what was impacted. Uh, you know, I obviously spent a lot of time documenting, and we can get into this later, um, you know, in the kind of period in which Ginger will drill into this more deeply, but, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at satellite imagery, trying to verify what people were telling me in these interviews that I was doing, going, you know, digging through rubble, trying to understand in forensic detail what actually happened in these places. The resulting story, which took 18 months and which was, you know, what I first published with Luke was The Uncounted in the New York Times Magazine, along with a sociologist, my co-author, uh, Anand Gopal. And, you know, its findings were pretty damning. You know, the coalition's data, you know, I built a database of all of these press releases. The coalition was saying, we have been so accountable for this air war. In fact, when we have a mis every time there's an allegation, we investigate it, we look at it. And so according to their data and the database I built, one out of 157 airstrikes in Iraq had resulted in a civilian death. But on the ground, what ultimately became a sample of 103 airstrikes in three cluster areas, we can talk later about what a cluster sample is, or even just how do you go about choosing sites and uh, you know how I was able to get to sites. But basically one in five of these airstrikes was actually resulting in a civilian death. And that was a rate that wasn't like twice as high as what the military claimed, it was 31 times higher. Now, it was really important for us to try to understand why was it so much higher? But when we would dig into the causes, we were kind of hitting roadblocks. I knew that, you know, 33% of them, or about a third, were what we would consider, traditionally consider so-called collateral damage. This idea of somebody happened to be walking by a legitimate target. Now, most people think that that's the primary reason for casualties, but it appeared that in about half the cases of civilian casualties of that sample of airstrikes, half of them appeared to be the result of poor or outdated intelligence. So there had been ISIS nearby, but they'd left. Or it had been a family home and not the target it was described as. But I kept hitting a kind of roadblock when I was doing this reporting to really dig into what the military's intelligence was. And so we published this investigation, taking you through the story of Basim Razo and, you know, this overall set of findings and this trip to a military base. Um, but I really wanted to dig into why and what the intelligence was. And I was able to, like using a kind of creative argument under the Freedom of Information Act, get the document investigating the strike against Basim Razo's home in about four months instead of like four to five to six years. Um, most of these types of documents state they won't be declassified for 25 years from the date after which they were produced. And when I began reading it, I was really taken aback by what they'd done. So they'd filmed this in 50 to 30 minute windows, about an hour and a half in total. And they determined, well, there was no women or children, even though they were filming during the hottest days of summer. They said there were no weapons visible, but ISIS doesn't obviously brandish weapons, that there was no overtly nefarious activity, but 
ordinary actions like opening the gate to the house so that Basim could let in his brother or so that Mohanad could let in Basim was seen as evidence of ISIS tactics, techniques, and procedures. And then the document also stated, well, we may have just mistaken this home for a structure next door. I wanted to, after that publication, I wanted to dig in deeper. And so I had already built this database of these press releases, and I basically used the same argument to try to get thousands of pages of records, more than just the incident on a single family, but thousands of these, could I do it? And over many years, I was able to do that. And that culminated in the publication of the civilian casualty files. And when I dug into those records, I saw that the Kabul strike was not an anomaly. <laughs> like I, I, I knew that before that happened because there was not a single finding of wrongdoing or disciplinary action in any of the 1,300 incident records that I obtained, not one. There was only one possible violation of the rules of engagement, and it appeared to have gone nowhere. The reports were rife with instances of confirmation bias in which ordinary actions would be perceived as a threat. And there were minimal efforts to identify root causes or lessons learned. In fact, nobody had studied these documents in aggregate. I was the first time, this was the first time anybody had done that. And there was almost no ground investigation or survivor interviews. Now, these are just the documents. When you compare them, I think that the part of this reporting that I'm the most proud of is that I was taking these documents and I was tracing them back to people on the ground and comparing what people told me and what I was able to verify on the ground with what they saw from the air and what they believed. So, for example, this is a woman named Ruskaya whose son one day went out to essentially grind wheat for, look for a wheat grinder because Mosul was under siege and they were hungry and they needed food. And so she, he set out to do that and he didn't come back. And she, she grew into a panic and she went looking for him that night, barefoot at hospitals, at morgues. And everyone was like, we haven't seen your son. And she kept asking, has my son with the cart, he, he used to drive a red cart. Has anyone seen him? Does anyone know where he is? And she did this for almost a month and three days. She didn't move when everyone else in her neighborhood had left because of the violence, because she was looking for her son. She was unable to find him at the time, but I went to the site where everyone was able to describe what the document said, that a man with a cart was hit and killed and taken away with the ISIS bodies. And you can read in the documents, they talk about seeing a man struck by ejecta from the blast. There's so many more stories. You can read them in the magazine piece with these beautiful photos by Ivor Prickett. They're also displayed out in the hallway with long captions. I, I'm not going to spend the time um, right now getting into each of these people who all have incredibly powerful stories. But in many cases, there was a really incredible, it was probably the most important reporting I feel like I've ever done, which was to take what these people never would have had access to, right? Like this, the intelligence that damned them, right? And to sit down and share it with them if they were willing to hear it and talk with them about it and ask them, what would you want to say to the people who believed this, this, and this about you? Um, so I'm really grateful that we were able to, to publish these pieces. You know, there was an incredible, there's a 10,000 page story in the newspaper and a 10,000 page story in the magazine. And, you know, I was really in the trenches with Luke and so many other people at the times from fact checkers to photo editors to um, graphics. And, just, you know, we published 1300 of these records uh, on the Times' website so people can look at them. And, yeah, I'm excited to dig into this a little bit more deeply, but I also want to tell you that it built up over time so it can seem really impressive all at once, but like, you know, in the beginning, I thought I would just go to a single town, right? And I was like, well, can I do this? And it just kind of grew from there. And so, um, yeah, I'm excited about the conversation Ginger's going to lead. Thank you.